Accessing your memories isn't a passive process. You're not taking a photo out of some drawer in the back of your brain and admiring it. You're reconstructing it, remaking that moment as you remember it. But memory isn't perfect. And so, for those really prominent memories, the ones you continuously return to, eventually it's like taking a picture of a picture of a picture. The small changes turn into big ones, and if you're not careful, you may find yourself trapped in something far different from that cherished moment you so desperately want to relive. Skip, 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 skip. Bloosh. Skip, 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 skip. Bloosh. Ripples emanate out from the newly disturbed water as another small rock makes a surprisingly loud sploosh into its waves. And the ripples continue outwards until they eventually rest at two pairs of feet. And by one of the pairs, a segmented metallic hand reaches down and starts scuffling through the pebbles before eventually finding one and picking it up. Now, Jacques, your technique is getting better. But you have to remember, choosing the correct stone is half of the process. But Horace, it's... It's really hard. I don't... Uh, why can't I just use this rock? He picks up a, a log. A very square rock. Because that rock has other things it's better at. Part of skipping stones is recognizing where each rock shines and then helping give it the exact throw it needs. It's hard, though. I just... I'm just worried I'll never get any better at it because it's, they all sink every time. Hmm. And to the left of you, Shock, this giant thin robot strokes his non-existent beard. Something he always claimed the wisest humans in the beyond were apt to do. Well, if you want to use that stone, but the method you're using isn't working, then I suppose we'll have to invent a different way to skip, won't we, little friend? I guess so. Now. And he reaches out his hand for the stone. Shock will hand it over to him. I want you, without the stone, to show me how you throw it. Well, I do this. Ugh. And Shock does the most overhand spike down into the water pantomime throw that he possibly can. Okay. Okay. Now. And he hands the stone back to you. I want you to try the exact opposite. Well, okay. And Shock will throw underhand back over his own shoulder. Give me a roll. Oh my god, my dice are over there. The one thing I didn't get. Ah. Uh. That's a seven. Okay, so you no no cats are getting injured. There's no. Well, he threw it back over his shoulder into the water. Oh, you so you turned around and then you threw it back behind you. Yes. Okay. And for a second, it looks like it skips, skips, skips across the lake. Wait, wait, wait! What what happened? I didn't I didn't see it. Horace, did it did it skip? Did it work? Well, Shock, why don't you see for yourself? And as you turn around, you can see dotted across the lake little angry glowing lights of the small insectoid-like crustaceans. What happened is the stone skipped on top of the clumps of the crustaceans. And they're not injured, but they're very upset. Ooh, did I hit the crabs? I am sorry, crabs. Ah... Uh... I'd like to think of it as the crabs helping you skip your stone. So be sure to say thank you 
Thank you, crabs. And the Technicolor lights slowly fade out, leaving behind only the illumination of the stars and the soft glow of the wheel's barrier a few dozen feet out into the sea. Horace, this is fun, but it's also very hard. I don't want to try any more today. Can I go back and get a snack? I'm hungry. Ah, right. Food. (laughs) Yes, I think J. Kel would have gotten something together by now. And as this giant robot makes his way to the steps leading from the docks up to the rest of the Wheel of Boz, he turns over and reminds to you, Now mind the stairs. Okay, Juarez. One, two, a one, two, a one, two, three. Stairs are just so much more exciting when you try to put some sort of rhythm and beat to it. You imagine yourself as a stone skipping across the lake, if only to make yourself feel better because you are marginally better at moving yourself across stairs than you are at moving stones across a lake. Shock likes to make it into a game where he has to get up a certain length of stairs before the crabs finish walking across one stretch of a beach. And what's your goal today? Oh, you got to get up all three flights to the point where you can't really see the beach anymore. Okay. Give me a roll. My dice are loaded. That is a, that's a seven. One, two, a one, two, three, a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, bonk! On the eighth step, Shock, you seem to misplace your feet a bit, and you accidentally stumble over, oh, Mm. Oh, and as you look down, you can see the bright technicolor crabs. The light blinks twice in a ha ha at you before sinking to the other side of the beach. Oh, or as I wasn't fast enough. And as you look up, you realize that Horace actually couldn't hear you. He must have crossed some bend in the stairs, and now you no longer can see where he is. Which normally wouldn't be an issue, but you find yourself at a crossroads. One set of steps to the left, another set of steps to the right. It's hard to tell. There may have been steps here at some point, but... So few machines go to the beach that the steps are kind of molded back into the mountainside. And it's hard to tell at this point which part was artificially designed anymore. Um, well, this is okay. Because I, I'm, I'm good at finding my way around places. And, um, when I'm lost, I'm always supposed to take right turns. Yes. And Shog heads up the right path. And as Shock makes his way across the right path, we can hear the waves brushing up against the rock. They're gentle and soft, but they're still waves. It's still a sea. And as we zoom out and out and out, we see a few sparse lights from the wheel and the bright barrier that protects it as the machines rest for the night. And we see all of that on the left. But shock, you went right. So you keep walking and making your way. And the steps are getting weird. There's long stretches of flat at points. They become ramps. Some steps are just rocks. But if you try to step on them, they actually shake a little bit. It's not perilous for you. It's just very clearly not used in a long time. Um, well, this doesn't look like the right way back. But maybe... I'm not, and if Shock looks behind him, does he see a clear way back to the fork, or is he getting more lost as he continues? Baby Shock, take a jam intrusion from me. Yes. You see the way back, but you hear something else. You hear what you can only imagine as the whispers of a ghost. Shock will slowly turn back around. Um, h- hello? Uh, 
He'll take a few steps forward. I think I've met everyone in the wheel, and I don't think I recognize your voice. Do you also live here? Is, is this where your home is? And Shot continues walking forward. The sound, which originally was just part of the wind, seems to echo more. And you notice it's echoing because it's coming from this cave, this little nook that's a few dozen feet above the sea below. Shock will step into it, still looking around for who's speaking. Just continue calling. H- Hello? Is is anyone there? Can you hear me? And in response to you in the distance, you see a little light blink. And Shock walks towards that light. As Shock walks towards the light, the rest of us can see around him that this is no natural nook. It's much too, to steal the shape of the rock, it's much too square. Almost as if it was some box built into the cliffside. But compared to the rest of the wheel, which has a more kind of rustic industrial feel to it, there's something more sleek about the creation of this area as if it was created some long time before the wheel with some different intent. As Shock walks in, we can see his reflection on these glassy mirror-like devices that extend to and fro inside of this box, creating almost the perfect sound cave, uh, an echo chamber. I think of it almost like a satellite dish meant to capture rays. One of those things where it's meant to take sound waves or electrical waves or some kind of signal and amplify it. And that light hangs over this metal circle the size of maybe a boxing ring or a small arena. And as you get closer, Shock, you just hear the voice even more. I... I don't see you, but I can hear you. What... are... do you need help? Is there anything I can do? And Shock will also try to reach out to the light as he approaches it. And as Shock reaches towards the light, he takes one step into the ring, and then another. And suddenly you don't just hear the voice anymore, you feel it around you, and you almost see this faint smoke that obscures yet brightens the light. And this smoke changes from this vague gaseous shape to something more similar to a ball of strings, a large cloud of threads, which you can feel linking to somewhere deep inside of you, especially near that robotic plate in your head and linking out somewhere in the distance, yet somewhere next to you, as if you're connected to some far-off reality that is at the same time layered on top of your own world. And as strange as it all is, this connection provides clarity. As you're finally connected enough to the voice that you were hearing, that you can hear its intent in all clarity. To the right? Maybe the left. The center? (sighs) Well, how is he going to eat if his bowl is at the center of the table? (sighs) Mama? Yes, Lowell? You moved the mirror to the end of the shelf again. It looks nice there. But it's not safe. I thought you were fretting over the soup bowls anyway. Well, yes. Because look at it. When it's two people eating, there's one bowl for each side of the square table. But when you add a third person, it gets all uneven. And he's definitely going to hate that. Uh, Unless, I guess, you turn the table sideways and put someone at the corner of the table. But no one eats in the corner of the table. And... Noel, it's fine. Not everything has to be perfectly in place. 
the well. Let me try just one more thing. Maybe if I move all of the bowls, then... What was that? I know, but I can't just leave it like this. No, honey. Outside. Outside? Uh, oh, 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 outside. But I'm not ready for him to be outside. Them. What? Yeah, there are two of them. And what a lovely dragon, too. What? Just a second. Well, I'll get it. That's, uh, that's not the issue. Just a second! Oh, why, hello there. You see that, Marv? You gotta put your biceps into a proper door knock. But, I suppose you need them first. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Insightful as always, TJ. Anyways, good afternoon, ma'am. It is a pleasure to be invited into your gorgeous home. Oh, well... We're with the Angulan Knights. I'm Marv Strongarm, and this is Commander TJ. That's Commander TJ to you. Exactly as I said it. So... Where's the fresh meat? Lowell, come say hello. Oh, well... Stand up straight, me, like a man. And don't flounder so much. If you got something to say, just say it. Yes, sir! Speaking of me, where's the food? You can speak. Uh, I'm on the table, sir. Thank you. At ease. <sighs> All right, then. <laughs> Boy, wait a second. There's three balls. And by my last count, there's one, two, three. It's four of us, sir. Exactly. So, where's the last ball? Right. Uh, it's just that I... Are taking a manly sacrifice, doing what needs to be done. <laughs> oh, I like it. Would either of you like some tea? Tea? Is that the kind of stuff skinny meat like this kid drinks? That sounds lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you hear him? You're on deck, water boy. <laughs> Get the gentlemen over here a drink! So... You want tea? Go! Yes, of course, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll get that immediately. Uh, um... Does your dragon need anything? <laughs> dragon? That's what we call a Z-Drake, ma'am. And an okay? No. She's fine. She sounds hungry. Nah, she just groans like that from time to time. She's probably upset about the flowers. I can tell what she really wants. You understand what she's saying? That's the kind of connection we men have with our states. Tea! I have tea! What the hell you got tea for? Oh! Sorry, I just thought someone wanted... I'll take some tea. Marv doesn't know what he wants. I want tea. Well, a real uncle at night only drinks the purest dough from the tallest mountains, but... <laughs> whatever, I guess. What the hell are you waiting for? You gonna keep standing there, or are you gonna pour us some tea? Oh! Uh, sorry, I, I I just thought. I did that. Well, then don't think. And then go on night knows, damn it. Sorry, uh, again. Stop apologizing. It makes you look like a scared little lamb. Besides, if you're gonna apologize for anything, it should be for dragging us out to this rust bucket down. We don't normally come out this far for recruits. But we really should, because it's beautiful out here, by the way. Really refreshing place to be. Us and Gullen Knights don't often loiter around flyover towns. And we're not gonna loiter here. Again, absolutely lovely. So, lamb chop. I'd... Um... Well... It's okay, sweetie. It really is. We've received your application, obviously. But now that we're here, go ahead and tell us some more about why you want to join the Knights. What do you mean, why? Battling with the coolest dudes in all of the Ninth World? 
racing around from victory to victory on top of rat as shit dragons? <laughs> Who wouldn't want that? Let's let him tell us. I thought I gave some pretty good reasons. Nevertheless, I'd like to hear him say. Why? Well, I honestly haven't seen much of the Ninth World beyond the small cabin. Things are always moving in the Paranthian Empire, always changing. Every year a new army marches by, only a few miles from our home, making changes I can't even imagine. So I guess I am interested in all of those things the commander said, but really, above all else, when I think of the Angulan Knights, I don't think of the places I'm going to go. I think of my home, and my mama, and I... I just want to keep them safe. <laughs> That's the most confident you've sounded all afternoon. You gotta have confidence to be an Angolan knight, but you gotta have it all the time. 28-7. Are you sure you can do that? Please, I need this. Nah, please. Need. All sounds clingy to me. And determined to me. TJ? Fine. We'll settle this like true knights. <gasps> Arm wrestle me, Marv! <laughs> With pleasure, TJ. Three, two, one. <laughs> Come on, Marv! I'll let your work cry. <laughs> oh, I will when I need to. Huh. Guess I didn't need to. I win. Again. Yeah, yeah. You know what they say. Speak softly and... <laughs> carry a strong arm. So... You made your point. His point? Oh. You so choose, you may attempt to join the ranks of the Angolan Knights. Really? Really. Giant battles, fearsome enemies, awe-inspiring victories, all in the service of keeping those you care about safe. If you say yes, you could be a part of all of that. So, what do you say, bud? Electricity whirs through power stand streets. Thin wires, thick wires, little solar panels, all sorts of ways of powering up and helping machines regain at least enough energy to continue. Yet in this area of brightness and warmth and power, something lurks in the shadows. Unit 909 walks up to plug themselves in. They start talking with the power source, not negotiating, there is no currency out here in the wheel, just discussing. How was your day? Standard stuff like that. Uh, how was your cycle? I don't know, something more robotic sounding. Keep that whole exchange in. How was your day? How was your cycle? You know, something more robotic sounding. <laughs> <laughs> but as they go to plug themselves in, a wind rushes past them, and they feel some static electricity on their plug. But as they look to the right to see the figure that caused this, they just see a cloak swish out of view. So Shock tugs on the blanket to make sure that it is securely tied around his neck and then leaps from stand to stand, bouncing across the heads of a couple of robots just plugging in, and then far steps up onto the ledge above, swings on a cable, far steps, down again, running in between a couple more machines. And as you're bouncing from machine to machine, none of which appreciate it, you hear a, ah, ugh, but you don't care. You're rushing because you know behind you something follows. Yeah, and where are you right now? So, so Shock is currently running down Power Stand Street, a squiggly, arguably main thoroughfare through the Wheel of Boz, where many types of machines can come to receive whatever type of power they need to get through their day. 
And sure enough, while you enjoy your bouncing for a little bit, after a while, you hear as large, hideous hooves gallop through the crowd, this demonic voice behind you. Shock! It's nap time! Am I, am I still baby shock? Or Yes. All right. No! And then Shock is going to far step up onto a rooftop and run across it. And let's let's have a chase. Reminder of chase mechanics, you will start three steps away from this monster that is chasing you. Because you're a baby, they will actually get two actions each turn to chase you. You will get one to outmaneuver them. When it gets to a five distance, you're fully away, you're safe. If it gets to a one, you are caught. You hear the monster beneath you just go, Humans are so unreasonable! And as you go to far step away, a second before you can, you actually feel this claw reach out from behind the crowd and try to swing at you. You want me to roll a speed defense for that? Yeah, roll me a speed defense for that. <laughs> well, that's a four. The claw snags on to your cape, which tears a little bit before you're able to far step away. No, 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 it's, no, it's so good. And as you're distracted a little bit by your outfit, your wizard's robes getting injured, this monster is able to get a little closer. So it is two steps away and it's your turn to make an action. So Shock, trying to cradle the cape to keep it from tearing further, is just running along a rooftop, kicks off of a chimney, and is going to far step onto, like, a pile of fabric and textiles that has just been stacked orderly next to the street. Okay, and since you're not super used to your powers yet, I am going to have you roll for this as well. Okay. A 19. Not many machines in the wheel use fabric, only those who go out and then humans. So these are pretty much all your clothes, so you're more familiar with it than pretty much any monster would be. So Shot kicks off this chimney. Far step flops down onto the fabric to like lessen the impact, just sort of like bounces off of it and then continues just running along on his little feet down the street. And as your obstacle, you're going to do that, but you see two elderly robots crossing the street, but it's not with a plane of glass, it's just with a large piece of sheet metal. <laughs> They're crossing the road, and that's what you have to get past. Shock is going to try to fire step, like, above the sheet metal, as if he had done a cool flip over it, but just using teleports to do what his little legs cannot. I rolled a one. Bad news. You go to far step, but you accidentally trip on a loose cable. And as you do, we can see behind you all of Power Stand Strip's lights just start going out one by no. one as you knock into this plug and oh, unplug it. Oh, no. And you stumble to the ground in front of the one of the old robots, which just... They let it out again. Ah. Uh. I'm sorry. And then Shock's gonna like try to crawl under the sheet metal quickly and continue like scampering away. Then as you scamper away, this thing still has one more action as you are two feet away and you notice that with all the lights out, you can't see much except for the bulbs from the eyes of this angry, venomous, vicious face which belts out at you. Shock, you get back here this instant! And the lights disappear as this thing jumps up into the sky to pounce on top of you. Yeah, Shock's going to just, like, do a dead stop so that this creature overshoots and then scurry in a different direction. That is a two. A crack of lightning lets out as this creature pounces on you, Shock. We see down closer to the sea, a windmill start to pick up speed as more wind comes through. It's right next to this zigzagging chimney, which is right next to the gently glowing barrier that is all on the sea-facing side of the Wheel of Bogs. 
and we actually see as a bird races away from the rain and bursts through this barrier and stands on top of the chimney while the rain continues to pelt on the barrier itself. Before we discuss Shock's fate, let's talk about the wheel a bit. So the wheel is a settlement composed very nearly entirely of machines. It essentially is a cylinder drilled down into an impossibly large mountain range with the occasional tunneler entrance intersecting it and a small edge that is open to the sea. It's full of relatively small, just a little bit ramshackle buildings that have been erected over the course of at least centuries and perhaps even millennia, depending upon who you ask, to house different types of machines or different supplies they might need. At the center of the circle, there's a sort of a larger building that everyone meets in. There's a uh, an energy barrier that surrounds all of the lived-in areas of the wheel to keep it safe. Specifically safe from the elements, mm-hmm. which is why I did the little bird thing. You, you might be surprised about this, but machines aren't super good with water. They tend not to mix super well. Depends on the machine. <laughs> Because the drilled-in cylinder has an open-air top, and then, yeah, it's like, uh, I think of it like a Barbie doll house almost, where, like, you've got the protected front half that, like, has all these uh, rocks and stuff and a secret entrance. But then when you flip the house around, it's just open air on the seaside. Mm -hmm. And because hail, rain, thunder, any of those could easily wreak havoc, there is this barrier that essentially serves as the fourth wall, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Their last submarine left well before Shock's time over creative differences, so not as much use on the beach side these days. <laughs> yeah, the wheel so the wheel originally was a kind of safe haven for machines. Mm-hmm. But in the past centuries, the wheel has kind of just folded into itself. There was a period where those living there just decided that they were happy to stay in the wheel. So for many, 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 many years, no one entered the wheel and very few machines left. It wasn't until six or so years ago that the wheel got an actual new residence. Now, I wonder who that could be. Horace walks up from the little tool shelf he has, a area that he stores all of his adventuring supplies in, and he walks towards the door. And as he opens it up, thunder still emanating in the background. He can see the shadow of this large, looming, multi-limbed creature. And in front of him, a small little boy. And the monster says in a horrifying voice, Tell him! So Shock is wriggling around, still squirming, like, No! No! You're evil, Decal! You ripped my cape! I am perfectly aware of that, Shock! Now tell your guardian what you did! I... I jumped on a lot of people's heads and I ran around, even when Jekyll told me to come back, and I didn't come back for nap time, because I'm not tired. So there. Oh, is it true, Jekyll, that you raced through Power Stand Street and caused an awful lot of trouble along the way? (sighs) Don't rub it in, Horace. And the seemingly threatening figure behind you, Shock, slinks down. And we can finally see what he looks like. As the figure slinks down, we can see what looks to be almost a robotic caterpillar that, when standing on his end, can't be more than a few inches taller than Baby Shock. This is J. Cal. Unlike Horus, who is a tall humanoid robot, about maybe Misha size, so giant to you as a baby, but not actually that, that big, Jekyll is a lot stranger. He kind of looks like a metallic caterpillar or bookworm, but up near where his head is, by where I guess his chest would be, there is a metal cravat. 
the little bit of showiness or fancifulness for this higher society robot who serves as your tutor. And also today, yes, seamstress, as he grabs your ripped blanket and mumbling to himself, scurries off to start sewing it again for the third time this week. (laughs) So yeah, tell me a bit about your house. So their house looks very like small and homey. There's not like a lot of decorations or a lot of furniture. And what is there is very utilitarian. There's places to store things that need to be kept somewhere out of the way. There's a work surface for anything that Horus needs to get done. There is a bed for shock, and I'll say more of a resting nook for Horus, not a bed in a traditional sense. And they have like a single table with a few chairs. But it's all like very warm, light colors, soft hues and light browns and all that. I would imagine there is some kind of radiator as well for when things get cold around here. And there's all sorts of weird chimney stacks and pipes and all that leading out to get various utilities they might need or to work some device that Horace has been working on. The whole thing gives off almost a fairy tale vibe because it somehow feels both old and dingy, but also very warm and comfortable. And by the door, there's always probably the worst part of the house, which is that little supply station I mentioned at the beginning, where Horace assembles all the things he needs and puts them in a little compartment to go off on his scavenging mission which is terrible both because you don't get to come along and it also means you're stuck with mean old J. Cal, who doesn't live here, but he might as well. (laughs) As you look, you can see that the uh, little satchel for leaving is getting filled again. Horace, you didn't tell me you were going on another mission. I'm so sorry, little friend. I didn't know I was going to leave so soon. But it seems that reference section needs an emergency part, so I need to head out in search of it immediately. Well, you weren't able to stay for as long this time, so, you know, I think I think that's a good reason for me to come along. Even if it's just for a, the other months you would have been here, I, I can stay for that long and come back after. I promise I'd even, I'd even take my nap times. I'm sure you would, Shock. But if you go out with me... Poor J. Kell's gonna be all by himself. He gets lonely, you know. Well, maybe I don't care if J. Kell is lonely for a little while. I'm I'm lonely sometimes, too. Does J. Kell care then? And f- for the record, Shock is also, like, pouting a little bit now, thinking about having to take care of J. Kell. You'd be surprised. I... I know your job is really important, and I'm glad you get to do it, but... I still miss you when you're gone, Horace. I don't want to be a part like this all the time. Shock. I I know I can I can be helpful. I have all these powers now. I I'd be I'd be really useful to have on an adventure. Please, please, come on, please, 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 please. And Horace starts stroking his non-existent beard again and thoughtfully looks up right where the still powered down power stand street is. All sorts of powers. Yes. Uh, But powers aren't everything, isn't that right, Shock? We can't skip stones just by throwing them however we'd like. Well, I guess, but this is different. I can do a lot more now. I know you can, Shock. I know you can do so many things. And that's why you spend so much time with Jake Hell, because you can have all the power in the world. But if that power is all you spend your time learning about, then you won't be able to use it to help those you care about. I guess I don't I don't understand and I don't like it. But if that's what you want, I'll learn everything there is to know. I'll show you that I can be a really great adventurer too. You'll see. (laughs) I'm sure you will. And with that, Horace, who had been leaning down to talk to you, stands up and walks out of the door.
Hello and welcome to the announcement break for Quest Friends episode 72, Shock's Memory Part 1. I am Kyle, your GM, and our outro song is Atoshio by Miracle of Sound. And we are here. We are in the final memory arc. And just like all the other memory arcs, this one has a twist, which you've probably figured out by this point. So instead of doing our regular announcements, I'm actually going to spend the rest of this time giving credit to those voice actors who helped make these two episodes possible. They're all extremely talented and we're all wonderful to work with, so if anyone catches your ear, you can find a link for at least most of them to their stuff in the description below. Before I start doing credits, a quick shout out to Hallie, who served as my co-writer for all of the, what we called Lowell's memory segments of these episodes. She and I have been co-writing things for a long time, and this is one of those products. At least half of the scenes you're gonna be hearing today, and then during the next episode, will have been largely written by her. And then a shout out to the rest of the Quest Friends team for providing feedback on the script and then going through the process of checking all of the auditions, especially Ari, because it was Hallie, Ari, and I that spent about 12 hours, I want to say, one day sorting through every single audition, and it would just feel wrong to not give her the credit she deserves for that. So thank you. And the kinds of actors we found in this process include in approximate order of appearance. Returning as Horace, we have David S. Deere. Playing Mama, Lowell's mom, is Fiona McKinnon. Playing Marv Strongarm is Caleb Smedra. Playing Commander TJ is TK Cooper. Playing Mako and an Angulan Knight, we have Chase Beck. Playing Mauve is Trisha Mellon. Playing Anuki is Colette Fian. And then finally, we have all of our Angulan Knights. They may sound like a crowd when you hear them in the episode, that's kind of the point, but each of them were chosen as they presented a unique take on these frat boy military members. So, in addition to Chase, as Angulan Knights, we also have Christopher Cologne, Gianni Matragrano, Joey Young, Josh Putnam, Jawan Royal, Tal Manir, and finally, finally, our two named Angulan Knights, besides, I guess, TJ and Marv, we have Cena Breyer playing AJ and Tom Laughlin playing Brock. Thank you so much to all of these incredibly talented voice actors for joining the show and helping us bring these memories to life. All right, that's all I've got for you today. One thing to note is even though I've been podcasting for three years now, I forgot that you can't have a phone on next to your recording equipment. So my audio in the Shocks Memory segments is going to sound a little weird for a short while after this announcement break, but I eventually figure it out. You'll be able to hear my corrected audio as well as more amazing voice acting in Shock's Memory Part 2, which will be releasing on Monday, March 22nd. But if you'd like additional content before then, you can find stories, artwork, and behind-the-scenes insights at patreon.com slash questfriends. I'll see you there. Goal and nice! Command TJ, sir! It's been a long hazing season, boys. You survived embarrassment, 
at the Made for a Minute Challenge. You faced the fearsome pandemonium of battles. And you even found your way back from the blood farm doldrums. In short, you've shown you have what it takes to become full-fledged Gullah Knights. Only one thing remains. Aiden! Yes, sir! What is your name? Uh, sir? Your name! What name will be spray-painted in the bathrooms of history? Uh, well, I always just write down Awesome Jock. Right on. The world will know the legend of Commander DJ and his new Lance Corporal, AJ. Brandon! Commander TJ, sir! How about you? What name will you use to rise above the normies? I don't know, sir! I just want to fight something! I just want to rock! <laughs> and rock you well, Brock. What about you, Lamb Chop? Uh, Lowell's? Fine. Lowell? What the hell kind of legendary knight name is Lowell? <laughs> you might as well stick with Lamb Chop in that case. Hey, hey. It won't make history, but it'll make a good snack. <laughs> but we aren't snacks. Are we knights? Are we knights? No, no sir! It's as our creed says. No force too great. No, no cause too mighty. So, what's your name? Uh, uh, Aegon? Aegon who? I... Aegon Stormbreaker, sir! Aegon Stormbreaker, huh? What do I think of that, knight? Aegon Stormbreaker! Aegon Stormbreaker! <laughs> yeah. I like it too. Dismissed! So, buddy? No, 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 no. Oh, right. I'm so sorry. Aegon Stormbreaker, sir. I panicked. No, it's fine. It's good. It's it's good. No, 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 Marv. You said you weren't going to do that. When you became my mentor, you said you weren't going to coddle me when I made bad decisions. Just help me make good ones. So, where were you? Hmm? Well, I can't promise my advice would have been much help to you there. Your name couldn't have been that bad. Harvey. Harvey. Marvy Harvey. But why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Starbreaker. Commander TJ, sir. Hey, uh, TJ. Got big news for you, Stormbreaker. War just broke out of Malevich. Or... Thamer. Eh, one of those flyover countries. Some hotshot Dane is leading a revolt and sent out a call for help. Now, normally we wouldn't respond to this kind of thing, but... I decided we could spare a few men to help her out with her little rebellion. A lucky gal. Yeah. Anyway, I know you love your small town... thing, so... I figure I'd bring the rest of the fresh meat along with us, too. So, it, it's training. But this is like a real revolt, right? There are actual people we can help protect? I guess. <laughs> so, get yourself backed up. You'll be fashionably late after dawn. And stop doing that smile thing. Marv, 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 Marv. Okay, that was, that was four Marvs too many. There's only one of me here. Marv! I'm going to go on an actual mission. Mm-hmm, yes. Things will definitely happen. I'd better start packing my bags. Oh, wait, you're coming too? Well, as you reminded me, I'm not here to coddle you when you make bad decisions. So let's make some good ones, shall we? <laughs> I prefer to think of it as you being there for the beginning of our legend. Legend? Yes, legend. Me and you, just you see. The world will know about the legend of Aegon Stormbreaker and... Don't you dare. Marvy Harvey! Shock! <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <sighs> 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 <sighs>
How can one tell the age of a hair bit? Well, you're supposed to look at how long the hair is and then wh which way the ears turn, I think. And if the ears turn this way and he cranes his caterpillar like body to the left. Um, um, they are mm, two years old. Excellent, excellent shop. Now, the next question, and Jaquel turns back to this projector board. It's a mixture of a blackboard and those old fashioned projectors. And I know what you're thinking, Kyle, those are called smart boards. No, 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 no. This isn't advanced technology. It somehow is the worst of both worlds. It's got the loud, like, scratchy sounds of chalk from a chalkboard. But also, like, it's got all the shadows from those old-fashioned projectors just when you lean over it. You've got to manually move it slide by slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> and J. Cal is moving many of his arms, writing out equations and facts and numbers in the dreariest corner of this room. So you are in shock, your little training space. We would recognize this from the first shock scene from this episode as being that very, I can't think of a term other than like FBI sci-fi, where it's, you know, that very, not industrial, but bureaucratic kind of sci-fi, like in the video game control. Space opera, empire, everything is sleek and like sheer metal. There's no comfy spaces or, or furniture. Yeah, it Exactly. So we are in that box from your first scene, because that was the kind of aesthetic I was thinking of, where it was the box with that single dangling light and the ring where you met the nano spirits. And it's been made, I'm not going to say more homey, but J. Kel doesn't live here, but he has made himself comfortable in your tutoring area. So in one corner, you've got your projector board. You've got multiple rows of desks, even though there's one of you there. I can't believe we recreated the school. We could have done anything else. It was a completely blank slate. And yet we recreated early modern school. Fine. Fine. You know, no, you, I'm you, not you, criticizing you, you. I'm criticizing the wheel, Buzz. There's a difference. These robots could have done anything with their lives, and yet they made a school. <laughs> In another corner is all of J. Kell's little doodads and what's-its and trinkets. J. Kell is very, you know, studious and firm, and he wants you to know important facts, because that's what machines do. Machines learn. And so in this corner is all of what he considers the contraband, the things that are too distracting for young minds, but they're not the kind of thing Shock would care about at all. They're like a little model airship in a bottle, a very tall deck of cards that he's been slowly assembling over the past couple of weeks. Essentially, it's just little gifts that Horace gives J. Kell because he enjoys the little trinkets and the little organizational things. And you can see that there are about five different unfinished things. You've got the airship, you've got the deck of cards, you've got your blanket, but what Shot considers his robe, which he's sewing together. And in the center of the room, with what is essentially a toddler gate around it to try to get you not to sneak inside, is the Ring of Power. The little area where you met the nano spirits that also amplifies Shock's powers and lets him use them without as much strain in new and inventive and what J. Cal would call destructive ways. In Shock, J. Cal's voice just starts drifting off as he starts monologuing. As your focus slowly turns back to that ring in the center of the room. I mean, it's very simple for Shock to get over a toddler gate because he is not a toddler. They stack two on top of each other. What are you going to do now, huh? Far step. God damn it. Yeah, Shock far steps over the two stacked toddler gates and then hops down into the center of the toddler gates. Now even more concealed from Jaquel because of two toddler gates in the way. And as you get in shock, you can feel the misty smoke of the data sphere surround you again. As familiar voices go. Hey, shock. Playing a hooky again? I can learn a lot more here. I can ask anything. Hmm, anything. Hmm. And what question do you have for the nano spirits today? 
how do I see where things are at all times? Uh, is there a spell that does that? Yeah, there's a spell that does that. We had it literally in the chapter five finale, Censor. <laughs> This literally came up, like, in the previous- well, not the previous, but, like, the <laughs> penultimate episode to this one. When I finished editing, like, a week Right now! This. You, you, you were editing it, like, very recently. <laughs> okay. Well, we do know one thing. Are you sure you want to try it? I will see everything! And as you say that shock, there's a little, like, burst in the room, like almost a sound wave, as you just plunge your little baby mind into the data sphere. You don't, like, physically go into it, but essentially you're accessing more than you're trained to access. And we can see the model airship shakes a little bit, the deck of cards flutter in the wind, and we see the little metallic hairs on the back of Jake Hell's back stiffen up. In shock, as you're trying to reach through, what are you trying to see? Uh, I mean, at first, the wheel, see what everyone's doing, like, the sea, to see what everyone's doing there. But then also, Horus. Where's Horus at? What adventures is Horus up to? And then, where, where are other, other people at? Where do people live that aren't the wheel? What, what are they up to? And then, what about even more people past that? And then, what about the mountains, like, the ones that you can't see from the wheel? Where are those? What are, what's up with them? And then... What's past that? Because Shock is not 100% sure. <laughs> Give me a roll. All right. I rolled a four. So Shock, you get multiple sensations. You feel on the back of your spine a jolt as Power Strand Street is lit up again, and a spark of electricity goes down the spine of the wheel. You can smell the crisp air of the mountainsides just a few miles away. You can see this old adventuring robot slowly making his way towards a town with creatures of less metallic skin and more organic. But what's more important than that is what you're not feeling in your room. Because as you start to access the data sphere more and more, the little light hanging above the center of the circle starts to swing left and right and left and right, and it starts blinking. Blink, 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 blink. And this light is normally bright enough to illuminate this small room, but it gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and it keeps flashing. And as it flashes, it sends out pulsating heat and wind, and we can see the little model airship. The heat actually causes the air inside of it to expand, no. and it eventually pops. No. And the glass doesn't break, but that pops. No, that's worse. The ends of the card tower that J. Cal was working on start to crinkle up and disappear as if you had set them at the edge of a fire. And your wonderful, beautiful robes don't get affected so much that you would notice, but we start to see the stitching just undo itself. In shock while you're doing this, you can't experience any of this, but you can hear a muffled voice. I... I can see everything. And with that little baby shock, you just flub over. Not unconscious, but asleep. <laughs> because you missed your nap time. Shock! In shock, you wake up to a tap-tap on the desk that your head has been laying against. We adult shock now? Yeah. What? 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 I'm, 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 I'm awake. I'm awake. It's fine. Fine? <gasps> it is most certainly not fine. And even if it was, fine would not do you well in the wastes. What with your need of protection and nutrition and all those other weird things humans need. I don't... Uh, whatever. What, what were we even talking about again? Was it just mitochondria? Mitochondria? How can you speak so frivolously of the powerhouse of the cell? Knowing how a mitochondria works isn't going to keep me alive when it matters. It's good to know, but it's, it's, it's fine. I've heard about it all before. I want to do something more practical, Jaquel. 
and he scuttles up closer to you. Something more practical, hmm? Yeah, let me just, I don't know, let me help fix some of the machines around here. We could work on the shield, or we could go through the spare parts dump. We could just uh, make something. Make something, make something. If the wheel wants something made, we'll vote on it and have reference section tally the results. Until then, you study. Besides, a creature like you can't make anything if you're not aware of how to sleep and to eat and to be aware of all of the dangers out there. Now, how does one catch a hairbit? <sighs> you make a trap with a loop like this so it jumps into it and yanks itself in the air. And may that knowledge serve you well. So does, so does that mean we, we get to go do something fun? Oh, I suppose. Chuckle cheer at that. Woohoo! <laughs> and then just far step away. Were you far stepping too? Somewhere that isn't here. As you far step away, J. Kel, without even turning around, says, And don't you think of stepping away before you clean your... <laughs> But then you're out of there. You have already far stepped away, probably stepped in the ring, because that'll let you far step pretty much anywhere without any extra cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where do you where, where do you end up? The spare parts dump. It's like the equivalent of a things drawer in a person's home, like the drawer where all the things but no one knows what they're for go. But it's just like a pile of parts, and it started as an organized pile some millennia ago, but now it's just a large heap of random bits and bobs. <laughs> and what are you doing with it? Shock's just grabbing things that take his fancy, and he's, uh, he's trying to put them together into something functional. Yeah, and as you try to put things together and functional, you hear a door open and close behind you. And you're certain because, you know, you're still in the house that it is Jake Hell, but you don't hear any of his voice. Instead, you hear... <laughs> Gearing up for your first mission already. Horace, you're, you're back. When, when did it happen? When did you get back? I didn't see you. Oh, about 27, 28, 29, 30 seconds ago or so. And Shock's going to run over uh, beaming. He very, very notably does not hug Horus at this time. It's not that he's never had any hugs before, but he does not hug often in the wheel because the machines just just aren't generally huggers. They're just, they're just sort of there. Yeah, Horus is a real awkward hugger. I imagine he's the kind of like pat pat. Like he's he's loving, but he, he doesn't want to infringe. And J. Kel just refuses. Not that you ever ask. But he still refuses. <laughs> and Horace says, ah, <laughs> Slow down. You don't want to get yourself poked on J. Kell's new toy. And you can see he's grabbed a sharp sewing needle. And I'm going to say one of those little like apples that has all the little sewing pins in it. Ah, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Except it has like the texture of an actual apple, <laughs> but is not edible. Do not eat it. How did, how did this get past our testing team? How, how did we put this product into development? Why did no one, why did no one run this past me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't think I've forgotten about your gift either. It's just a bit different. And Horace starts walking over to a resting spot. He is walking with his walking stick. A long, it looks like a large screw almost, but with a ball at the top of it. And it isn't something Shock would notice a whole, whole lot, but as time has gone on, he started leaning on his walking stick more and more, and he starts relying on it more and more as almost a third leg. He walks over to a resting spot and sits down and says, I think I found my time for retirement. W what? But what do you what do you mean? Who who's going to bring stuff back to the back to the wheel? Well, and he stares forward a little bit before turning over to you and you can see the little LED lights in his eyes glisten. I was hoping it be you. Here! 
there! It's okay! If you could just follow my companion there, he'll evacuate you safely. Evacuate? Y yes, to save you. You need saving, and we're here to give it! But we're the ones fighting this day. See? It's not safe here! But we'll return everyone to their homes after everything is taken care of! <laughs> Why are there so many bombs? Oh, that's just Dreddy. Little rascals been planting traps for our foes all over the place. Great work, Dreddy Bear! <laughs> right. So, it's all depending on the collateral damage, which is why you all need to follow my associate then. Everybody, this way! The faster we evacuate, the faster everybody can return. We'll have you all back home lickety-split. Yes! Lickety-split. The speed at which I will defeat... Ah! What the fuck are you doing here? Ma'am, put down your rapier. I'm an Angula Knight. <laughs> no shit! I can tell by your ugly ass armor. I asked what you were doing here. Uh, wait, that's no way to talk to your military aid. Oh, my military aid. So kind of you to provide assistance that we didn't ask for. You sent out a call for help. Not from you. All you cockroaches do is storm in and make things worse. You just want to beat up the bad guy and then leave. Isn't that helpful? Not when it kills and displaces civilians! But surely that's better than dying! But that's only you're dying! And what about the people who die after you leave? After their homes are gone, their fields are ruined, and their livelihoods tanked! Did we ask for you? We have this under control. <laughs> Good lord! I beg to differ, ma'am, but I don't think you do. Oh, I was just waiting for this! I was just waiting for you to know my situation better than me! Can't have a conversation with Nangulin Black without that! No, that's not what I meant. But judging on my understanding of all of the surroundings... And what do you understand? Tell me everything you know about this situation. Well, there's a rebellion. Against who? Against a, a tyrant. Which one? The one who's hurting people. Who's hurting people in what country? This one. Right. So, are we in Malevich or Theamor? Uh... Un Fucking believable! You weren't even brief before you waltzed in here uncalled and unwanted! And yet, once we win, your insipid parasitic organization will get all the credit. Parasitic? Do you know how many lives you fucks have ruined? But... No force too great, no cause too mighty. You ever thought about the people who aren't good enough to be included in your charity? No. Maybe you should start. Skip, 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 skip. 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 Blue. Shock, you're back at the beach, and we can see that Horus is just posed like hunched over, like he just took a big boulder and threw it into the lake. Because in his own words, Skipping stones is a lot less magical when that's the only experience. We have to experience the whole breadth of rocks on water. It is your last night before going out on your own. You and Horace decided to spend your last night the way you spent many nights here at the beach. Tell us a little bit about the beach. If you've ever been to a beach in like a cold, rainy place, you, you have a good idea of what this beach is like. 
I remember once when I was young, we went to the Pacific Ocean for the sake of saying that we had been to the Pacific Ocean. And it was like overcast and a little bit rainy and it was cold and like there was sand there, but there were also a lot of rocks and like cliffs nearby. And that is perpetually how I imagine this beach outside the wheel. It's surrounded by cliffs and coves. There's this little stretch of sand and it's all very like wet packed sand at all times. There's constant spray off the sea as the wind whips in. Even on the days when it's sunny, it's never truly warm here, and the beach is somehow overcast more often than the wheel itself is, despite being slightly more open to the air. <laughs> and there is this one little semi-rusty metal pier. It's only semi-rusty because part of the metals it's made of don't rust. Nobody really knows why. And just this tiny little sailboat moored to it for an indeterminate period of time. Yeah, at this point, the sailboat, I would say, is almost... It's not only hooked to the pier by a rope, I would say it's also, like, rusted together with the pier. Yes. And you're here with Horus, skipping stones, your little secret. So, reference section finally tallied the votes, and the town agrees. Starting tomorrow, you are... The new me. Well, you don't have to say it like that. <laughs> I suppose that's not quite accurate, no. I'm just glad some of your lessons stuck, and he skips another stone. I'm... I'm kind of scared, actually. I know I always ask you what it's like out there, but I don't really... I don't really know. What am I going to find? <laughs> Has J. Kel been filling your head with fears of humans and hair bits again? I just... I worry that I'll seem strange. Is that so bad? And he skips a stone, but this time you can see the illumination of the craves as they skip across. Out there, in the wastes, in the beyond, being strange is the best thing you can be. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Horace, for everything you've done. You've taught me so much. You took care of me since I was small. I, I, ju I just, I just want to say thank you for being there for me. Yeah. And he looks off in the distance, his eyes covered by the hood. There's actually another reason you were chosen to go out into the wastes. Well, what is that? The wheel has all the information you could want. And I'm sure you would agree, thanks to all of your time with J.K.L., some information you don't. But the one thing it's lacking is practical experience. I'm glad you've thought I've done well, Shock. But there are some things even a world-traveled machine like such myself can't provide. One of them is experience with those flesh and blood machines we call humans. I mean, I guess I'm a little curious. I've read so much about humans, but I don't know, I don't know what it'll be like. I know you've said they're so different from each other even. It'll be weird. But I guess that's, I guess that kind of makes sense, you know? Being from a place where we, we machines always stay the same. It could be nice to be in a place where things are different for a while, you know? Helps you appreciate what you have already. Because you'll all be waiting here when I get back, right? Oh, <laughs> trust me. We machines of the wheel aren't going anywhere. We'll be here when you come back. Waiting for you and all those changes you'll bring. All right. Gift time. And Horace turns over to a little basket it probably looks like a picnic basket, except it's made out of metal and looks like a chest instead and is very secure and, and locked and looks nothing like a picnic basket. And he starts ruffling around in it. Oh, I'm I guess I probably should have gotten gifts for everyone before I left, but I'm not sure what I could have given them that wasn't something they already had. Nonsense. Gifts are things you bring back home with you. And when you go out... 
They're the things that remind you of how to get home. And the first thing he brings out is this immaculately sewn blue blanket. But as he gently and carefully and kind of shakily hands it to you, you can unfurl it to realize it is a full wizard's robe, complete with hood. It's... It, it's real. Oh my... Thank you, thank you, did Oh, <laughs> I'm not the one to thank. You should thank yourself for finally convincing J.K.L. that robes are the most functional kind of protection for a human to have out in the wastes. <laughs> and that's an in-character laugh from Shock. But... I will take the thank you on his behalf, <laughs> even if he'd be reluctant to take it himself. Uh, no, my gift for you comes from a, it's from, from a place, a, a land. It's from a land far to, far to the north, east, the northeast. Yes, yes. Are you making that up? Uh, give me a few more cycles and then I'll have made it up. <laughs> uh, anyways. And he takes his screw staff and he sets it to the side as he reaches in to grab this other item. Now you ask a dozen different adventurers and they'll give you a dozen different answers on what makes an adventurer an adventurer. Trust me, I've asked. But... In my opinion, nothing quite makes an adventurer. And he grabs the gift and turns over to you. Like their walking stick. And in Horace's hands is something you've never seen before. In the rusty and practical and mechanical world of the wheel, there's nothing so smooth, so graceful, yet so haphazard in a way only organic things are. It glistens in the moonlight, and you can see the rust and tear on Horace's segmented hands through the staff itself. And he hands this thing to you, saying, It's a material called strong glass. I didn't know much about it, but I inferred it, it was... It doesn't matter what material it's made out of, or where I got it, or anything else. All that matters is that it felt right. And he holds your strong glass staff out to you. Shot takes the staff and hugs it to himself. Thank you. It, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Well, I hoped I could find something appropriate for my uh, little friend. Wherever you take that robe and that walking stick, just know that all the wheel, yes, even J.K.L., is there with you. And when you do come back, they'll be your keys home. Aegon, you're back! Oh, I was getting kind of... Starbreaker! Took you long enough. What you got to report? The Rebellion one, sir. The Jetco branch manager has relinquished power. Who? Oh? The tyrant Malevich was rebelling against. The rebel leader and I took care of his branch. Good work, Aegon. Pretty successful first mission for a rookie. Don't let it go to your head, though. Nothing worse than getting cocky when you don't deserve it. Yeah. Nothing worse than that. Yo! Over there! Brock! Report in, would ya? And to get the stragglers! Sure did, sir! They went down like a rock! Like me! Brock! So you caught the bad guy, huh? I guess so. How'd your part go? Mm, not many people to evacuate. I think they'd already gotten most of them. You did well, though. Did you get a gift basket? Trust me, we won't be getting a gift basket this time. Mm, not a fan of ours, was she? Yeah, the rebel leader, Marv, said some things. She really hates us, Marv. I didn't know it was possible to hate an organization dedicated to helping others so much. Help is relative sometimes. 
It's like oh, the, the citizen I tried to help evacuate, Mako, the one with the, the whistling bomb bucket. He tried to show me all these shortcuts, like he was the one evacuating me. Took forever to convince him to follow me. Took him a lot less time to convince me to follow him. You took orders from a civilian? He seemed to know the situation better than me. But that's against protocol. Well, that's what I'm saying, bud. Help is relative. Not everybody needs the kind of help the Angulin Knights give. But don't the Knights protect, I don't know, everybody? Well, protecting everybody is a pretty tall order. It's hard to do that in just one way. I just want to stop people from dying. And that's a pretty tall order too. Look, Aegon, Lowell, you may not be able to stop the processes of time or change, but I believe you can find your own way to save people. It may just not be a way the knights agree with. But the Angolan knights were how I was going to! I know! Me too, at one point. I really believed in them. But look, as your mentor, it's my job to help you make good decisions. What are you saying? Is it there now? Wait, what's there now? What? The very good plant. Do you hear that? I don't hear anything besides a new key. Commander TJ Drake? That a new key? <gasps> That's my name! Could you please give me the very good plant? The one by your feet. Uh oh! This? What are you picking that thing up for? I think Anuki wants it. Why do you think she wants a flower? Flower. That's what they are called. Your house had lots of flowers. TJ's already said she hates flowers. Flowers taste good, but people get mad when I eat them. Well, she just told me she likes them. You're going to have to elaborate. I don't know how. She is just in my head? She's got a voice, and it's in my head, and that voice is telling me that Anuki wants this flower. Psychic Link! Psychic Link! I make them when I really like things. Although, I've never made them with flowers. I must like you more than flowers. <laughs> I like you too, friend. Here, let me get some more flowers for you. Just let me grab a nuke and we'll be ready to shove off. Oh, Stormbreaker. The hell you think you're doing with my Z Drake? Oh, I'm getting Anuki some flowers. Anuki hates flowers. I've told you that. Well, sir, Anuki just told me that she loves them. Look, she's eating them right now. Told you? What do you mean she told you? She told me. You know, the psychic link. Psychic links? <laughs> Stormbreaker, that's absurd. That thing's never going to be able to communicate with you. She can barely communicate with me. I don't like TJ. <laughs> oh, what a load of Belagna. Now, give me back my Z Drake, or you're in for a world of hard, rookie. I don't think she wants to go back. Uh, oh, com Commander, can I have a word with Stormbreaker before we- Oh, you don't think? Well, I've owned her for years, way before you came aboard, Lamb Chop. So, I know what I'm talking about. Ouch, 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 ouch. Stop pulling her! You did all right on the mission today, but you gotta learn her place in the pecking order, chicken. We can only help the weak if there's respect and discipline and fraternity within our ranks. Got that? But you're hurting her! She's fine! No, she's not! You'll understand, Z Drakes, when you get one of your own, Lowell. But now I'm thinking, you'll never be a good enough Angulan Knight to find out! <laughs> I'll never be an Angulan Knight at all. Wanna run that by me again, Lamb Chow? My name is Aegon Stormbreaker. It is if you're an Angolan Knight. Fuck the Angolan Knights. How can you claim to protect anybody when your own Z Drake needs protection from you? Because she's my Z Drake and I can do what I want. What? 
You want to arm wrestle for some base daughter? Because I'm ready to go, rookie. <laughs> arm wrestle? Arm wrestle? No, 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 no. I'd rather just do this. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Hit me with your little baby's first whatever. <laughs> You're in over your head, lamb chop. So get out of the kitchen! Cause you can't take the heat! Wow, TJ just went out with a single hit, huh? Yeah. He did. You doing all right, bud? That doesn't matter. How's Anuki? Anuki has many flowers! I think she'll be all right. All thanks to you. I'm sorry, Marv. I know you believe in the Angulan Knights. I believed in the Knights. But now I believe in you. Have since we first met, really. Thanks. So, I guess we're leaving then. I guess we are. Gotta get started on that legend of Aegon Stormbreaker after all. <laughs> well, don't forget Marvy Harvey. And Anuki too! To skip stones. Uh, me neither. How do I skip stones? I think it takes a very delicate touch. How to? Probably. Well, good thing this is a flashback, or he'd be fucking dead. Like, well, I'll take you with me next time, son. Here, take this brooch to remember me by. Fuck, fuck you. Fuck you, Kyle. And you can see he's grabbed a sharp sewing needle. And I'm going to say one of those little, like, apples that has all the little sewing pins in it. Oh, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. Except it has, like, the texture of an actual apple, <laughs> but is not edible. Do not eat it. This is this is just a burger. This is just a burger. Yes. <laughs> it is just a hamburger. But don't eat it. How did, how did this get past our testing team? How, how did we put this product into development? Why did no one why did no one run this past me? I just Tom in a stop boardroom, just like picture of you. It's stocks, but it's just burgers, and it's uh matricy of burgers on one side. Bergs. Bergs. It's it's the stonks meme, but it, it's bergs. I want this. <laughs> I want this so badly. Be be the memes you want to see in your life. Well, I hoped I could find something appropriate for my my little friend. Does that sound too much like a penis? Well, it didn't until you said it now, but you just inceptioned my brain with that one phrase. <laughs> <laughs>